All right, welcome back everyone. We're gonna continue on with our topic of concrete. This is gonna be our last of the six part series where we look at special concrete construction, some cast in place, specialty, slabs on grade, and a little bit on loading. So this is what we're gonna look at. We have uh, foundation, slabs on grade, cast in place concrete, specialty concrete, concrete toppings, roof decks, underlayment. This last little section is throwing in all those other topics into kind of a condensed format. So let's start with foundations. Uh, basically, the purpose of a foundation is to take the building loads and distribute it to the ground below, right? So uh, some of that can depend on the strength of your soil. If your soil is weaker, of course, you need a larger area to distribute that load. So um, some different types of footings. We can have a continuous. We see this continuous footing up here, this A, where it's basically one continuous strip. And this is this widened part. Because if we had, say, this foundation wall directly on the soil, it's such a small area. You know, uh, pressure is equal to force over area. So the smaller your area, the less you can distribute that force. Um, so the, the, this would have to be much wider, right? A continuous footing means that underneath this wall, there's like one continuous line of concrete versus a stepped footing. I can see it's coming along here and then stepping up and over. Uh, we have an isolated footing, meaning it's just its own little entity. And here I can see these two columns are, are supported by a single, single footing. And if you have a very weak soil, you may have to have a much bigger distributed load or distributed over a much wider area. So you might have this mat or raft foundation supporting a bunch of columns. So this would be a typical column detail that you might see showing our, our footing. Uh, and in this case, if you look at this note here, it says typical slab block out. So because of this block out, what we can see is all of the, the building loads, which we'll talk about in a little bit, are being transmitted through this column down to this footing and these slabs over here are not actually supporting the building loads themselves. They're more like just self-supporting. So here's a picture of what it would look like. You can see that this column uh, directly onto the footing is what's supporting the, the building loads above. Uh, and then you'd come back and of course fill that in. You'd probably have, remember we talked about these, these expansion joints or isolation joints to isolate the column concrete from the rest of the slab concrete to give that little bit of play needed so we don't break our concrete. Uh, this looks like a continuous footing. So we have a footing coming along here. Um, just some more pictures, get an idea of what these things look like. Looks like this is a stepped footing coming along here and stepping down. And you can see down here we have another footing. Uh, looks like they're gonna put a column here or something. We have our embeds, which we talked about last time. And here we see this little stepped footing here. I believe that's the same picture as this one, uh, just looking at the bottom of the footing. Uh, and then there are cases where we may need to support uh, a much higher load, like if it's a high rise, or we have very poor soil. In that case, we may have to go much deeper into the soil down to something with, with a better bearing capacity, a stronger soil, or all the way down to bedrock. And that's really what we're talking about with piles and caissons. So you can see this uh, crane is drilling down and then you could have driven piles where you're, you're driving your, your, your columns down with a pile driver or something to something more adequate. Um, or you could have caissons where you're drilling down and filling it full of concrete and on top of these piles or caissons, you have this cap. And there's a lot of terms that are used somewhat interchangeably. See how this is called a pile cap. Sometimes you'll hear it called a pier cap. Um, but regardless what it is, it can be a, a big concrete cap that's tying all of your, your piles or caissons together. Slabs on grade. Um, this ties into a little bit of what I was just showing, showing with that picture where I said that there was the little cutout. And that little cutout means that it was an independent floor system. Uh, so that means that if we look at the loads that would be coming down in this building, I could see they'd be transformed or transferred down this column right to this footer and then the load goes into the soil. Uh, so this would be an independent floor system, meaning this floor over here is not supporting 
the building loads. The building loads are all going directly down to the soil, so really they're just self-supporting. Um, and the, the, the building loads would be what, what's bringing the load down. We'll talk about loads in just a little bit, but walls, footings, columns, all distribute this load down to, uh, to the soil. Uh, now, we can also say that we have a foundation and floor system that is basically one unit. So I can see that the, the building's load would be distributed to this lower floor level, right? The slab on grade, and the slab on grade would distribute the load to the soil. So clearly this is an independent. I can see that the, the slab has not been poured yet, slab on grade, but I do have my columns already holding up the building with their particular uh, foundational footings. And this would be an example of the opposite where it's all one continuous system supporting the loads from above. Um, so let's move on to cast in place structural concrete. So we talked a little bit about loads a second ago and this really deals with how we bring the loads from the building all the way through our structural system using concrete. Uh, so we could have concrete walls, columns, pilasters, piers, beams, girders, structural slabs. All of these are considered structural components of the building, meaning they're, they're holding the loads of the building and distributing it throughout in some way, supporting the loads, right? Uh, here's just an overview picture, and, and you can see you have your floor slabs and primary beams and secondary beams. You might call these outside one girders and... Once again, there's some interchangeability of some words here. Uh, but the idea is that when I have this complete concrete building, uh, what I'm doing is I'm taking the, the, the loads, it might be people, furniture, or the self-load of the concrete, and, and the load from the slab would be distributed over to these beams. Uh, these beams would distribute their load to these secondary beams. These secondary beams would distribute their loads to these columns. These columns would distribute their loads to the footers, and finally the footers would distribute their loads to the soil below. So that's that's kind of the, the, the flow of loading, and it's actually the way it would be designed, starting off with, you know, how much load are you supporting on the on the floor? You know, what's your, your pounds per square foot that you need to support? And from there you can say, well, you know, how thick does this slab need to be to support those loads? After you do that, then you can determine, well, how, what, is, what are the dimensions needed for these beams to support the floor load and the load from above and so on and so forth. When we're designing these structures to handle these loads, there are various types of loads we need to account for. We have dead loads, live loads, uh, live roof loads, wind loads, snow loads, earthquake loads, thermal loads, and this isn't all of them, there's, there's still more. Um, and when we are putting all these loads together, where you're looking at different combinations. and Well, there's different guide books out there. Uh, there's the LRFD, which is a load factor resistance design, and the ASD, which is the allowable stress design. So those would be two uh, structural design manuals that would be used to figure out um, what kind of loading we need to uh, support. Meaning, you might know the actual load, but you're always going to have a safety factor in there, right? So if if you know your floor can support 20 pounds per square foot, just in case there has to be a party or something and there's a little extra capacity in there and you go up to 30, you don't want the whole thing to fail, right? So we always account for this, uh, for these types of conditions by these load combinations, which is in essence a way of adding a safety factor. So for example, this would say, uh, well, let's look at our dead load and we're gonna add in 0.6 or 60% of a wind load and then or 0.7 of an earthquake load. And you would take whichever one is higher when you look at what the wind load is for that particular area, what the earthquake or seismic load is for that area, and then you can have 12 different load combinations and you're always looking for the worst case scenario uh, on how these loads are all combined together. So looking at a couple in particular, really just dead and live since those are the most, most common. When we talk about dead load, uh, dead load is this self-weight of the building and the materials within the building, right? So we know what those are. Those are a known quantity. It's not gonna really change over time. We know how thick our walls are. Um, we, know, we know what the, the, the materials are. Um, and because of that, when it comes to something like these load combinations, 
our dead load, we usually don't need to add much as a, of a safety factor. Now, with a live load, we do have to add much more of a safety factor because it's much more variable. So you can see two different uh, load live loads here. One is a floor live load, one is a roof live load. And really what the live load is, is talking about, as the name implies, it's, it's the, the movable objects in and out, typically people. And it does depend on what kind of occupancy you have within the, within the structure. Uh, a roof live load, uh, you have a little bit, it's not very high, it's usually about 20 pounds per square foot. And the idea behind this is for anyone who needs to get up onto the structure uh, or have temporary structure, things that are not going to be permanently placed on there. Uh, and usually you have to also include the roof snow load as well. Uh, it can be incorporated depending if you use the ASD or the LRFD. Uh, but you can you can look at the how the roof load and snow load in essence work together. Sometimes uh, the load combination, if it's a high snow area, the snow load's so high that your your live load can be neglected. So when we talk about bringing these loads down, I mentioned this earlier that we we have our floor load and we have to transmit these loads down right vertically down to the soil. Well, we can do that using these columns, piers, pilasters and walls. All of these are structural members that would bring the load straight down. And I think, I think most of these words are probably pretty common, like a wall. Uh, but a pilaster may not be as common to you. What a pilaster is, is it's almost like a column that's built into a wall. So if you look at a wall, and you'll see these uh, both interior and exterior, but you'll have these little bump outs. And, and, and that's used because you need a little extra support there when you like you might have a um, a beam that is resting on your pilasters so it's a little extra support right there and we can see we have a free free standing column right here and we have this one little note that walls are supporting both uh, the vertical loads and the horizontal ground loads uh, but they also have to provide anchorage and resist uplift <laughs> a lot going on with that wall uh, so that was that was the vertical. We also have lateral. And, you know, what do, how do we get the loads over to these vertical members? So like I said, you're following the load, right? So our beams or our girders are what are going to transmit the loads from our square foot area over to these vertical to get back down into your your grade or to the soil. And we do this with girders, beams, slabs, or walls again. So when we talk about beams, we could have grade beams. That's at grade level. And this is really that last little step where it's transferring the loads to, um, to your foundations. Uh, or you could have beams higher up. Uh, you could have simple, continuous, uh, basically what a, a simple support is would be like if I had a beam and it was only supported on two ends by two columns, that's called a simple versus continuous would be like if I had a column here and a column here and a column there and basically it's continuous over multiple columns and the reason we care is is if you have a if you think about what the the load is for the the support load uh, and the deflected shape we end up with a much stronger system if we have a continuous beam and we also have these girders so really what a girder is 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 just a means to support uh, your beams in essence, right? They can also carry columns or may even carry a wall, but um, I tend to think of them being like more your, your fundamental support, your outside, your larger primary carrying member, your beam, you might hear it called a stringer um, or something that's gonna, gonna connect all of the, transfer the load from all these beams to one central beam. So here we see some grade beams. Like I said, the grade beam is really your last beam right before you get into your foundational support. And we can see how the load would be transmitted down. Um, so let's move on to specialty concrete. One is this fiber reinforced uh, concrete, GFRC, glass fiber reinforced concrete. And these little fibers are basically just thrown into the mix while you're mixing up your concrete providing that, that tensile strength. Because remember, concrete is really weak in tension. It's strong in compression, but weak in tension. So what we normally do is we have to add rebar for our structural strength, right? Well, 
when you're using your, your glass fiber reinforced concrete, what it's really about is not so much a structural strength, but what if you want to form your concrete in more of an artistic manner, something like this building over here with all these shapes. You couldn't really put rebar in here and have it structurally sound, so it's probably supported by some of their steel structure on the inside would be my guess. Um, but you can mix these fibers in here, and the way these fibers work is concrete, as soon as it wants to start to go into tension, these fibers prevent that because they're very strong that way. Uh, they are extremely light, and actually you can have a thinner concrete because of these fibers uh, and still not have all the cracking. So you'll see it in these more architectural designs. Uh, one example would be a, a GFRC curtain wall. And basically uh, it, what it is is you have a skin of concrete that's pretty thin. It's this lightweight glass fiber reinforced concrete. It's only half an inch to three quarter inch thick. Uh, and then you have a steel uh, backup frame. So you really your structural supports coming from the steel backup frame. And I think I have a series of pictures. So this is what the, the front of one of these would look like. Um, and it looks like a nice textured concrete wall. Uh, but then if you flip it onto the back side, what you see is your steel structural supports. And this whole thing would actually be pretty light, this curtain wall. And you could hook a couple of these curtain walls together, giving you the, the aesthetics that you're looking for on the front of your building. Uh, here's another picture of it, just the back of it being hoisted into place. Uh, we can also talk about concrete toppings. So as the name implies, it's basically uh, concrete placed on top of other concrete. Uh, so it could be placed over slabs or precast structural elements. And in essence, if I had, um, we talked about precast before, maybe I'm bringing these, these other precast elements on the site and then I put a, a, a topping on top of it. It could either be bonded or unbonded. Bonded if you want to create maybe a particular finish. Um, like say you wanted to have a colored concrete, but you didn't want the whole thing to be colored. You might have like just a little one to one and a half inch special concrete finish on top. Uh, you could also have an unbonded concrete. Now an unbonded concrete needs to have its own structural strength. So, uh, so it's a little thicker, like three inches thick, and it also has to have some rebar or welded wire fabric in there in order to give it that tensile strength. So structurally insulated roof decks, basically it's, it's a, it, the idea is like if you could do a lightweight concrete or it is a lightweight concrete that you're going to put on your roof deck in order to provide a little extra insulation for the building. This is a gypsum concrete and the gypsum concrete is a lightweight concrete. Uh, normal concrete weighs 150 pounds per cubic foot. So if you had one cubic foot it weigh 150 pounds, it's pretty heavy. Uh, but this gypsum concrete is much, much lighter at, at 35 to 55 pounds per cubic foot, uh, which means that I can put it on top of the building and still have it be relatively thick without adding a massive amount of weight to the building. So you can see here it's typically two to three and a half inches thick. Uh, there's also some foam boards that go underneath the, uh, the gypsum concrete in it to give the light reflection, fire resistance, insulation, sound absorption. These can also be uh, prefabricated, and you can see some examples of that in the book. So here's what it looks like. This is the, the gypsum concrete that is being placed on top of the structural slab concrete, like this would be like maybe the final roof structure, and then this is our support within, uh, within the gypsum concrete. And another picture, basically the same thing. This one does show our foam boards in there, foam boards in there. Uh, it does show our tensile support with this wire mat, and then it shows that we're pouring our gypsum concrete over that. And then on top of that, we're going to have our roofing, which would be the you know more the the waterproofing of the whole system. So the last topic uh, is an underlayment using uh, cement for uh, underlayment. Underlayment is what is going underneath your finished flooring. So example, this is like a ceramic tile. Maybe you're pouring a ceramic tile in a basement or something and your, your concrete isn't, isn't level and it's cracked and maybe it's misformed and there's dips and humps. And what this is, is it's a very liquid uh, concrete or actually more of a, a cement mix that will, you know, almost like flow out like a liquid and it would make everything level 
uh, for your underlayment so that you can you can put on your final flooring material. Uh, thicknesses are usually in there too. I, I don't think of it being six inches, but I suppose it could. I, but they're eighth inch to a six inch slab thickness. So not structural at all. It's just a way to give you a level base in order to apply your tile or whatever type of flooring material you might have. So a little bit more on the underlayment, cement based underlayment. It could be either gypsum or cement based. Uh, gypsum, we already said gypsum concrete is lightweight. Well, it's the same thing with the cement based gypsum. Uh, it's less expensive, but it also isn't as, as durable. Uh, it can have moisture issues. Uh, so if you're concerned about, if you're in a very wet environment, you might want to take that into consideration versus a cement based, uh, pay a little bit more, but it is a little stronger. So that's what I have for this one. I uh, hope you found that informative as always. Uh, reach out and let me know if you have any questions or comments and I'll talk to you all later. Thanks.